right so welcome to everyone i always for, always forget about that little announcement <laughs> okay we're all set so welcome to everyone who's here this morning it's good to see you and thank you for taking part of your saturday morning to to be with us here um you may be re we're here in january perhaps when philip spoke to the ruskin art club on Ruskin, Endure, and Wild, and various other things beside. We had a really lively, excellent conversation, um, and Philip gave us a really wonderful lecture in January. So he has very kindly agreed to join us again um, this weekend and again next weekend to talk about the work of iron. A little bit about Philip before we get started. He's the author of nine works of nonfiction. His latest book is Albert and the Whale. It's a study of Albert Durer and Ruskin and various other things, it's it's one of the most brilliant books I've read. It's there's full of so many ideas, um, which is very characteristic of Philip's work, which is always very, very energizing and gets me thinking about all sorts of things. I read his books and then I immediately want to talk to someone about them. Um, so I encourage you to read Philip. Um, he has also written England's Lost Eden, Adventures in a Victorian Utopia, Wild's Last Stand. Um, his book, Leviathan or the Whale, won the 2009 BBC Samuel Johnson Prize, and W.G. Sebald chose his book, Spike Island, as his book of the year in 2001. Philip is also co-creator with Angela Cockane of the digital Moby Dick Big Read, which you can access online, and I think we have a link to that at the Ruskin Art Club with Philip's biography, so I really encourage you to check that out. That's a fantastic project. Um, Philip swims every day in the sea. Yeah, he has done so already today, I'm sure. I think you just said that. Um, yeah. And he is uh, here to speak to us. So I will turn over to him now. Thank you for Thanks, being so here very much. It's an absolute, my, my absolute pleasure. And it's lovely to be back with you all after such a great um, uh, uh, event we had in January and really energized me. I, I was left completely buzzing by that. But that interchange with, with, your, with your members and, um, and their wonderful um input and an appreciation so um looking at the work of iron um it's really difficult for me to say how wonderful this essay is uh, we were just saying before the meeting started that uh when you write about ruskin or think about ruskin often the only thing you really want to do is read him out um uh um so but uh so i always feel kind of really uh a bit of a fraud trying to add my skim and my my gloss to to his words but I'm, I'm just going to give you a little bit of context about about the scene and setting for for for, for the lecture which was delivered on the 16th of february um 1858 so pretty pretty central in the 19th century um and the setting is the um the royal victoria and sussex hotel and uh, i think we have a picture of that now sarah please yeah. mind bring you up there we go. Thank you. Um, well, I have to get out of my. Uh... Sorry, can you share that because I've lost my notes now on the screen. Uh, uh, I don't know. Oh. Um, can you on. reduce? Uh, 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 let me let me start again. Yeah, sorry. Because without, I... without slideshow, would that be better? Can Can you just show the image? Yeah. Like that. Yeah, but I'm, li I li oh, hold on, wait a minute, let me see if I, uh, sorry, I've got, I, I lose my, um... you lose your oh, there you go. right, so I've sorted, right, fantastic. Okay, good. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, uh, the Royal, uh, Royal Victorian Sussex Ho 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 Hotel, which was established um, in the 1830s, so-called because um, Queen Victoria, then Princess Victoria, frequently stayed at the hotel. And um, I don't know any of you who, who, who have ever been to Tunbridge Wells um, uh, 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 in the home counties, as they're known in England. It's a very sedate place um, uh, 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 and probably has been for a lot of its, its existence. Um, it's famous for... It's uh, Georgian pantiles, which are um, a kind of shopping mall in a way, a, a veranda covered mall. Um, it's a gracious place for walking and displaying, um, but it certainly wasn't used to uh, lectures such as John Ruskin, or at least I didn't think so. And I, I looked at some of the um, lectures which were being delivered at the hotel around that time. And it's quite interesting because 1857, a year before Ruskin's lecture, 
Um, we had Miss Tunbridge Wells, Mr. Woody's Oleo of Oddities, um, Mr. W. S. Woden, the popular polygraphist. So polygraphy, I always thought was lie detection via detecting uh, changes in the body's um, uh, uh, state. Um, gave an entertainment to the Royal Sussex Hotel on Wednesday last and a second on the following morning, to much to the satisfaction of the crowded audience, audiences pleased to hear them. So you sort of get a sense of the kind of um, performances that people might be used to in this venue. Um, in the year that 1858, the year that Ruskin was performing there, the Swedish national singers with Madal Huma, the noted viol violinist, uh, were there for a week or two. Um, performing twice at the Sussex Hotel on a Wednesday. Um, but uh, more interestingly, it was a, a lecture shortly after that, um, given by Mr. Joshua Smith, um, uh, which cons consisted brief chiefly of a series of experiments to ch show the recent discoveries in electricity and spectrum analysis. The lecturer gave, a, the lecturer gave an account of the late discoveries of solar chemistry the voltaic battery and experiments, illustrating its remarkable heating and luminous properties, electric lamp, its uses in lighthouses, and experiments showing the different colored bands produced in the spectrum by luminous vapors of metals, and experiments to illustrate the startling announcement, and this is in inverted commas and in bold, the world on fire. Uh, it's kind of remarkable to set that against uh, Ruskin's themes, um, this notion of the world on fire, which, of course, unfortunately, California and many other places have experienced this past uh, few years with the advent of the effects of climate change. Um, and also set against um, Ruskin's uh, storm cloud of the 19th century. Um, and I also looked back because Tunbridge Wells has a particular character in English culture um, to, and it was a spa town. So rather like Bath, uh, Southampton, where I live now, where I'm talking to you from, um, various other places, Buxton, which um, Ruskin knew well. Um, so I didn't realize that it had been spa, a spa town for quite so long. Um, so I was reading, I was, I was reading um, uh, a, a mask performed by Ben Johnson and designed by Indigo Jones in 1620, which was entitled News from the New World, Discovered in the Moon, purported to be a glimpse through a new invention, the telescope, of a satellite where ladies play with moon calves instead of dogs, and which had its own spas like Tunbridge Wells, where lunar birdmen called volunteers performed a dance. And in that same mask is the mention of a strange monstrous serpent or dragon seen in St. Leonard's Forest, which is the forest next to Tunbridge Wells. Um, and thinking, of, thinking about how Ruskin has spent time in Tun Tunbridge Wells as a, young, as a child and a young man. He talks about the mountains of Tunbridge Wells which is kind of a joke, really, because most of that part of England is pretty flat. You have the downlands, but there's certainly no mountains. And this, this dragon is said to be nine foot long with black scales, a white collar and a long neck, with two great bunches either side, the which would soon grow into wings. It was a particular and insistent nuisance since it ate both cows and men. Um, so this kind of uh, a setting for for this 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 performance of Ruskin in my mind because of the performative nature of Ruskin's lectures uh, and the sense that it was his metier. Um, the public lecture was a complete shortcutting of the distance between his material and his thoughts and the public that he wanted to reach. Um, it wasn't like a, a printed book. Um, or many any other sort of way that he his information might be um, conveyed, and today that seems very similar to our modern technology, to the the podcast, um, uh, of a, di a direct reaching out to the audience. Um, and as I was thinking about this, um, it 
really struck me that at the same time as Ruskin is writing the work of iron, he is advising on a work of iron. So the next image, please, Sarah. The work of iron being the Oxford Museum of Natural History, on, on which Ruskin is advising, as I'm sure many of you know, um, which at one level is, is a stone carved interior. It's a Gothic, great Gothic building from the outside. Um, but the interior is absolutely extraordinary because those stone columns suddenly sprout iron buttresses and ivies, like sort of tendrils of ivies growing up them. Um, and you have this extraordinary sense of the iron growing out of the stone. It seems almost strangely alchemical in a way. It seems as though the building is growing up out of out of the earth and of course that's where the gothic style as ruskin explains to us in the stones of venice is the gothic style uh, comes from that notion of of, of growth the, the the columns in a gothic cathedral are like trees and they're creating this canopy above and it's very telling that that that, that as ruskin is about to deliver this lecture he is advising on this building um and uh for me the uh there's some interesting correspondences with um with Herman Melville um because Herman Melville is a direct contemporary of Ruskin both born in 1819 um the title of the lecture of Ruskin's lecture the work of iron in nature art and policy had a assonance with me with the chapter in Moby Dick um uh, which Melville entitles of whale of whales in paint in teeth in wood, in sheet iron, in stone, in mountains, in stars. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting um, uh, relationship there. Um, in both writers uh, have a particularly visionary uh, profile. Um, for us now, because of the power of their work, is almost more powerful now than it was in their own lifetime. I mean, Ruskin was a, an intensely public figure and, and, and much published, but the power of his work now is the fact that lies in the fact that we're sitting here in 2023 discussing him. Um, uh, and there's lots about uh, this essay, which spin out on that sense of a growing awareness of the way science is going to affect our world. Um, Melville writes in the same way. Um, and next slide, please. So. And hanging in the roof, that, that iron roof of the Natural History Museum in Oxford, are a series of whale skeletons. Um, uh, and their bones silhouetted against the sky the same network. Next slide, slide, please, Sarah. The kind of counterpoint of the iron architecture above them and of mm. the skeletal structure of the whales, which are themselves architecture. Whales are architecture. Um, and the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. They both seem to speak of the kind of transitional elements of Ruskin's lecture, the work of iron. Um, and in the way his images seem to us, seem to us now in, 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 in the, that piece of writing, terrifically modern, um, uh, almost surreal at times. Um, there's, there's, there's many points in which you read that lecture in which you might as well be reading a work of modernism, a, a modernist lit, lit, literature um, from uh, our century rather than Ruskin's. Um, and I felt also just to sort of t go back to the Melville thing is this notion of uh, literature as a kind of pseudo sermon. Um, so Melville's 
uh, chapter, The Whiteness of the Whale, has a real uh, has a real resonance again in what in the way Ruskin is writing here. Um, the way that they both um, create almost ironic images of natural processes uh, and transformations um, and so heady in both writers but most especially in the essay which we're going to look at in a moment that they they really um they really really uh seem to um go beyond uh their period i, th I think ruskin is a writer working in the future i think his his vision is looking to the future. Um, he seems to me like Blake in that way. And Blake, who was a great favorite of Ruskin's, um, of someone whose um, hope for an idealistic world is addressed in the macrocosmic and microcosmic way that they look at the world around them. And that's really what the work of iron is about. Um, uh, so I'm just going to start look, looking through the lecture now, and I know you, many of you would be um, uh, familiar with it. Um, and just looking at the way the lecture opens uh, uh, with that wonderful, uh, again, this seems to be quite similar to Melville in a way, the kind of hesitancy, of a, a, a faux hesitancy of Ruskin's opening. When I first heard you wished me to address you this evening. It was a matter of some doubt with me whether or not I could find a subject that could possess any sufficient interest to justify me my bringing you out of your com comfortable homes on a winter's night. And that did remind me of the opening of Moby Dick where Ishmael is in a wintry uh, New York and then in New Bedford and the sense of who is this person to address us? Um, uh, and Ruskin goes on to say, I, when I venture to speak about my own special business of art, as though he's a kind of traveling salesman, it's it's such a, a people forget how funny Ruskin is. He is very funny. Um, yes. So he's kind of he's like he's he, he's setting himself up as this kind of it's a sort of um, yeah uh, ordinary person. Um, and um, and that lovely line. It is almost always before students of art, among whom I may I may piss it. I may sometimes permit myself to be dull. Anyone who treats university classes might <laughs> feel uh, 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 an empathy there. Um, um, but as he said, then he says. So he says. A mere talk about art is seldom of seldom of much interest to a general audience. So what's he going to do? How is he going to entertain us tonight? You can see people fidgeting in the front row uh, of the Sussex Hotel thinking, what have we, you know, what have we brought ourselves into for this evening? Um, so he goes, he goes in very familiarly. Tunbridge Wells was my Switzerland. Well, that's such a outrageous thing to say to anyone who knows Tunbridge Wells is really has very little to do with Switzerland whatever and of course Ruskin Ruskin's knowledge of Switzerland is vast and Tunbridge Wells is would have little relationship to that um but he talks about these clambering sandstone cliffs of stupendous height above the common but they're not stupendous height but in his imagining they are and um it's beautifully conspiratorial, the way Ruskin draws you into this argument, the way he's setting out. You don't know where you're going. I mean, where are you going? You really don't know where you're going. He's setting up signs and wonders, rather like that dragon in St. Leonard's Forest outside Tunbridge Wells, you know, the, the, the dragon of St. George, perhaps. Um, it's sometimes, I think, sometimes Ruskin presents his work as though he's seen it in the innards of an animal or, or 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 in tea leaves there's some sort of futurity to the way he presents it um and that sense of um the uncertainty of the world around but here in this room we're going to work out some way 
of creating a new way of looking at an element, the work of iron. <clears throat> so there's a kind of <clears throat> subjectivity to that, the work of iron. It's as though the iron has an animate self. It is a kind of um, uh, 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 something which is responsible to us. The work of iron, it's going to perform for us. Um, uh, so as it moves on, um, starts talking about, um, so this is a spa, remember, and uh, the water in a spa often contains a lot of iron. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, Ruskin talks about the spring over the orange realm of its orange realm rim of its marble basin. The memory of the clear water sparkling over its saffron stain came back to me as the strongest image connected to the, this place. So it's a, a synesthetic relationship. What he's talking about in this place, it's as though he has specifically written it for Tunbridge Wells. Uh, almost as though he was writing it like Ben Johnson creating that mask with those strange notions of, 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 of the home counties as kind of alien place. Um, and then so, but then he, he, he explains that the subject is too wide to be more than suggestively treated. Um, so he draws, he tells us he's going to draw from his own fields of work. Um, and then he sets out his, his stall. And I'm going to talk about, he says, um, the subject which I've announced to you, the functions of iron in nature, art and policy. Um, well, this evening, I'm just going to concentrate on the nature part of the lecture and leave the art to the second one, second uh, uh, installment next week, um, which is not to say art isn't embedded and riven through um, these next few pages. They are so exciting to read. Um, the way that he conjures the material and the built world and the natural world. Um, uh, he sees iron as the essential component in human progress. Uh, the way that oil, mineral oil was seen in the 20th century. Um, we see those things differently now. Uh, there's another reason why this is so interesting, this lecture. Um, it, 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 he he sets up the sense of um, uh, the passage of time by talking about rust. So you, as he says, you probably all know that ochreous stain, which is often thought to spoil the basin of your spring, is iron in a state of rust. And when you see rusty iron in other places, you generally think not only that it spoils the places it stains, but that is, it is spoiled itself, that rusty iron is spoiled iron. And since he's setting up the fact that what's spoiled, it's, it, this, these are natural processes. Um, uh, and as he says, but not at all. On the contrary, the most perfect and useful state of it is that ochreous stain. It's usefulness to us in this respect. Um, and that he goes on for in that condition, it fulfills its most important functions in the universe and most kindly duties to mankind. It's so arch. It's so funny. I get you can see where I, where I keep thinking of Mel Melville. Um, he's sort of making these allusions to the spoilation of things. It's 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 a reference to M Milton's Paradise Lost, perhaps. Um, to the notion of what goes wrong with biblical dominion. And this is something which Ruskin is thinking a lot about at this point. Um, um, uh, the notion of humans uh, uh, having stewardship of, of the earth's resources as being a God-given thing, a, a God, a dominion, God's dominion given to man in the act of creation. Um that's not going so well in, in many ways in Ruskin's eyes. Um, and as he moves through this, this sequence, just, just breathtaking um, imagery where he relates the iron 
to oxygen and the breath of life. I, I quote, and now it is this very same air which the iron breathes when it gets rusty. So there's a sense of the iron taking on an animal nature in a way. Um, but the metal absolutely keeps what it has once it has received of this aerial gift. And Chris Dust, which, are, which we so much despise, is, is in fact just so much nobler than pure iron in so fact as it is iron and the air. Incredible image. Incredible image. It's almost alchemical the way he's talking about these things. Uh, the, 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 the way that he's accurately portraying, rather like that lecturer who preceded him in, in the Royal, Royal Sussex Hotel, uh, he's actually talking about scientific processes, and processes which are being analysed and determined and used. I mean, this century is running on iron, mm -hmm. uh, as no century has ever run before. Um, everything about it is to do with iron. Everything to do about his process is about iron. Um, uh, is the notion that something as intangible as air is part of that process. Um, and then the, the, Ruskin says, there is only one metal that does not re rust readily, which is, of course, of gold. And gold set against iron, these elemental symbol symbolic substances um, have this extraordinary uh, meaning in the 19th century because of capitalism, because of industrialism. Um, the way these things are linked is never before. It's never before. Um, I mean, that first starts in the early modern world, really. Um, but here it's just come to this point at which they are now dominant over the human race. Um, uh, the getting of gold and the making of iron. Um, is there not such as such you know, this, uh, 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 the last paragraph on that, that, that page. Um, is there not something striking in this fact considered largely as one of the types or lessons furnished by the inanimate creation? Here you have your hard, bright, cold, lifeless metal, good enough for saws, swords and scissors, but not for food. You think perhaps that your iron is wonderfully used in pure form, but how would you like it in the how would you like the world if all your meadows instead of grass grew nothing but iron wire extraordinarily surreal image um as often ruskin can create surreal images such as there's a passage in Fors clavigero where he talks about a man growing a sunflower out of his head um he has these extraordinary um uh, leaps into the fantastical um, almost in a kind of Alice in Wonderland way, um, where he turns the mirror on the world, a mirror on the world, um, to make us see it from a different angle. Um, uh, and he talks about, to the deceptiveness of iron, um, which, he, which, which is... Uh, describes it here as um, a globe of black, lifeless, excoriated metal. It would be that. It probably once was that. But assuredly it would be, were it not that all the substance of which it is made sucks and breathes the brilliancy of the atmosphere. And as it breathes, softening from its merciless hardness, falls into fruitful and beneficial, beneficent dust. So iron is going back to dirt. It's going back to dirt. In, as he says, into the rocks that frame the mountains and the sands that bind the sea. This is poetry. Hence, it is impossible for you to take up the most insignificant pebble at your feet without being able to read, if you like, this curious lesson into it. So we're, 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 we're with Ruskin now, picking up this pebble out, out of it. And the pebble talks to us. The pebble talks to us. 
You look at it first as if it were earth only. Nay, it answers, quotes, I am not earth. I am earth and air in one. Part of that blue heaven which you love and long for is already in me. It is all my life. Without it, I should be nothing and able for nothing. Unbelievable. Unbelievable um, leap into um, the life of a pebble. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the idea, and these are modern ideas too, people are thinking about how the inanimate, inanimate can can have a kind of life. Um, and then he moves from that to talking about art, although he's not meant to be talking about the art, art at the moment, but he's talking about the stain on the marble, the stain on the great earth. So this is the rusty iron. Wheresoever you can see it, far and wide, is the colouring substance appointed to colour the globe. So it's as though it has become an artist's pigment. Um, so he clearly is talking about art. Lots of the terms of this sort of scientific query, inquiry, are artistic. Um, Think first of all of your pretty gravel walks in your gardens and fine like plots of sunshine between the yellow flower beds. Fancy them all turned to the colour of ashes. It's a kind of apocalyptic image in the same way as his storm cloud of the 19th century becomes. Um, think of winding your ways over the common, warm as to the eyes they are to the foot, and imagine them all laid down suddenly with grey cinders. Um, he goes on to talk about iron as the binding factor of life. So um, fancy it all changed suddenly into grisly furrows in a field of mud. That is what it would be without iron. So iron binds everything about our life, um, physically, uh, geographically, um, economically, um, and this lovely uh, paragraph where he he, 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 he he runs away with his ideas. This is the way Ruskin runs away with an idea. It's so beautiful. Pass on in fancy over hill and dale till you reach the bending line of the seashore. Go down upon its breezy beach. Watch the white foam flashing the amber of it and all the blue sea embayed in belts of gold. Then fancy those circlets of far sweeping shore suddenly put into mounds of mourning. All those golden sands suddenly turned into grey slime. The fairies no more able to call to each other, come unto these yellow sands, come unto these drab sands. Um, he's quoting from The Tempest. And of course the, the, the famous scene in The Tempest is, uh, uh, early scene in The Tempest is when a drowning duke falls to the bottom of the ocean and his eyes turn into pearls and his bones turn into corals. Um, there's something quite Blakey in the, about this, this sense of, of, of science being melded with the, um, with the numinous, with the uh, heavenly, with the hellish as well. Um, uh, And then in the next sequence, um, he, he talks about gestures to uh, these days of swift locomotion. Um, and of course, he's talking about the most preeminent use of iron in his period, which is for railway engines. They've revolutionized everything about Britain, um, the industrial process, the way people live, the way people travel the way people love, you know, it's uh, spreading human genes much more ex effectively throughout uh, the country than than the closeted villages and uh, uh, incestuous um, uh, line, gene lines uh, of that. So that this this is expanding. It's expanding um, the, the way we live. He doesn't approve uh, of the railway in many ways. Um, he writes uh elsewhere ruskin about how um upset he was when the rusk when the uh, railway comes to buxton 
which is another spa in, in the Midlands of England. Um, that sense of iron coming to spoil the spa town, though, the waters of the of the town. Um, uh, 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 and he's very uh, 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 conscious of that. Um, his evocation of England in, in this sequence is, is very beautiful. Um, again, it reminds me of Blake's Albion. Um, he talks about the wholesome, the warm self-sufficiency and wholesome quiet with which our, nestle, our villages nestle themselves down amongst the green fields. If you will take the trouble to examine into the sources of this impression, you will find by far the greater part of that warmth and satisfactory appearance depends on the rich scarlet colour of the bricks and tiles. This is what he called the warm building. So iron is responsible for the very way that the kind of idealistic notion of England looks, especially in a place like Tunbridge Wells, much less so in the place where he gives a lecture the next year in Bradford, mm -hmm. where where the whole uh, uh, whole uh, consequence of of the the new use of iron has become uh, uh, very problematic for for someone like Blake in that the he he he's he he, well, he he says to the people in, in Bradford if you if you he opens his lecture saying if you will tell me what you ultimately intend Bradford to be um mm. so he's addressing the town almost the way he addresses iron itself what how how are you how are you going to evolve out of this these satanic mills, as Blake would see them, um, of a place which looks as though it's made of iron now, as you know, the darkness of 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 the mill cities of Bradford, where my my father was born there, um, uh, uh, it's a blackened you know chimney place. It was until my childhood, indeed. Um, so the contrast is what iron in it in its pure state in the in the state of clay and brick. And of course, Tunbridge Wells is famous for being red brick and tiled. The pan tiles, the, the pavements are red brick in in Tunbridge Wells. This is a this is a comforting image for the people in the Sussex Hotel to hear. You know, it's they might be feeling a bit a little bit less restive about the lecture as they sort of have this evocation of this idealistic place, this idealistic England, um, red as Ruskin says, as honourable as the soldier's scarlet of laborious battle. He crams so much into so little. The soldier's scarlet, the soldier's scarlet of laborious battle. There's so much crammed in there. Um, I say, turned at once into the colour of unbaked clay, the colour of street gutters and rainy weather. That's where they would be without time. Um, then going back to art, he he is completely talking about art all the time in many ways here um, in the next sequence. There is, however, yet another effect of colour in our English county towns, which perhaps you may not have yourselves noticed, but for which you must take the word of a sketcher. He's being ironic again. He's calling himself a sketcher. Uh, he, he's not acknowledging the fact that he is a great artist, artist in himself. Um, and then he talks very beautifully about um, uh, 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 the, 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 the deep greyish or purple hue of our fine Welsh slates on the more respectable roofs, the more respectable roofs, the very ironic title again, uh, made more blue still by the colour of the intervening atmosphere. Um, I do think about Ruskin's blue eyes and red hair here. His red hair, which might as well as be of iron itself, the way he wore a blue necktie to make his blue eyes look more blue. Um, thus, so far, we have been considering the, the use and pleasantness of iron in the common earth of clay. But there are three kinds of earth, he tells us, three kinds of earth, clay, lime and flint. These being what we, are, what, what we usually deal with um, these being what we have usually to deal with, nature seems to have set herself to make these three substances as interesting and as beautiful for us 
as she can. His acute, Ruskin's acute sensitivity um, to the elemental, to the natural. Um, it's almost as though he is elemental himself. There's something of the kind of airy spirit of, in, in Ruskin, in the way he talks about these things. Um, and he talks about, but in, in the, the limestone, limestone and flint, she paints in her own way her, her their native state. So she's using those things to recreate herself, nature. As in her paintings of flowers, to draw us, us, careless and idle human creatures, to watch her a, a little and see what she's about. Well, that's what Ruskin did most wonderfully, especially in his art, to watch nature a little bit and see what she is about. That, I mean, anyone who's seen his watercolours of the natural world. That's what I'm seeing throughout this essay, those pictures by Ruskin. Um, for nature is always carrying on very strange work with this limestone and flint of hers, laying down beds of them at the bottom of the sea, building islands out of the sea, filling chinks and veins in mountains with curious treasures, petrifying mosses and trees and shells. In fact, carrying on all sorts of business, subterranean or submarine. I'm thinking of Blake's Newton here, Newton sitting on the ocean bed, studying his, his geometrical devices while the wonders of the benthic ocean float around him um and this 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 next phrase which is almost wildian or wiesmont in its sort of decadent listing of things in a, in, in its a, a concentration and the pretty colors ruskin writes in her flint books form those agates jaspers cornelians bloodstones onyxes cairngorms Cairo, Cairo, Cairo phrases, I've never been able to say that word, which men have in like manner taken to delight and cut and polish and make our ornaments of from the beginning of time. Um, all those beautiful violet veinings and variegations of the marbles of Sicily and Spain, the glowing amber, orange and amber colours of those of Siena, the deep russet of the Rosso Antico, and the blood colour of all the precious jaspers that enrich the temples of Italy. He's obviously speaking from, uh, uh, from experience now. He, he's re recollecting his own experience of, 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 of Italy. Um, but all the lovely transitions of tint in the pebbles of Scotland and the Rhine. Uh, this is this is the natural decoration of the world he sees as he sees it um but this is not all nor even the best nor the best work of iron its service in producing these beautiful stones is only rendered for rich to rich people who can afford to quarry and polish them <laughs> he's making a really interesting point about economic access to these things um Uh, 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 in, in England, Portland stone, of which much of Britain was made from the 18th, 17th through to the 18th and 19th century, was a, a royal monopoly. Um, you know, the elements of the earth are even controlled by the imperial capitalist state. Um, and then he, 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 he talks about the noblest colour ever seen on the earth, one which belongs to a strength greater than the nat of the Egyptian granite into a beauty greater than that of the sunset or the rose. And what is that color? It's the crimson of blood, the crimson of blood. So we ourselves are riven through, are veined with iron. Um, this wonderful, so wonderful sentence here. Is it not strange to find this stern and strong metal mingled so delicately in our human life that we cannot even blush without its help? If there's one sentence in this whole lecture that I would take away as me, which is the most astounding thing, is that it that story that that tells. Um, 
He goes on, think of it, my fair and gentle hearers, how terrible the alternative. Sometimes you have to act, you have actually no choice but to be brazen faced or iron faced. So he's bringing you right into the physicality of the people who are in that room, in the hotel, listening now. What are they thinking about themselves and the relationship to the world? You know, their, their sedate Tunbridge Wells has just been totally transformed into some vision out of Milton or Spencer uh, or Blake. Um, some craziness has been recreated uh, in their heads, some kind of thing, prophetic state out of the ordinance of the bricks um, and the earth and the blood running around their bodies. Um, it's absolutely amazing. Um, and he ends that sequence on the uh, uh, on the iron in nature, uh, talking about the more useful, the more serious uses of the metal in the economy of nature. But what I want to wish, what I wish to carry, excuse me, but what I wish you to carry away with you is the remembrance that in all these uses, the metal would be nothing without the air. Nothing without the air. The pure metal has no power and never occurs in nature at all, except in meteoric stones. Such a brilliant notion. Except in meteoric stones whose fall no one can account for and which are useless after they have fallen. In the necessary work of the world, the iron is invariably joined with the oxygen and would be incapable of no service, would be capable of no service or beauty, whatever, without it. Just amazing. Uh, it does remind me of the stars falling out of the sky in Blake's poem, The Tiger, um, and the notion that it's only through um, something which Ruskin would see as God given this 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 transforming of elements um, that anything exists at all. And the most transforming aspect of that is the air meeting the iron. Um, well, I'm going to stop whittling on now because uh, uh, I'd really like to hear what you think about the uh, the uh, the lecture and, um, and 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 the ideas it raises. You want me to stop the share with the slide? Yeah, please. Can you? Can sure. you? Okay. There we go. Philip, I have a comment. Yeah. At least, at least the beginning comment. Um, when Ruskin went to the to deliver this lecture, uh, eighteen fifty eight, he is really pretty much at the height of his popularity. Hmm. He is known throughout, essentially, the entire English speaking world as a great sage, a great observer of nature and art and uh, and then beginning on the edge of this social policy thing that you'll talk about next week mm -hmm. um cook reports in his introduction to uh this lecture in the volume of the library edition which contra contains this this lecture which i think it's volume 16 he says that ruskin got thunderous applause when he came in yeah. Uh, I, I thought that was very, very touching. Gives you a sense yeah. of how mm -hmm. enormously popular Ruskin was. It was a great coup for Tunbridge Wells to mm -hmm. have him come to speak to them. He was one of the most famous men of the age. Mm -hmm. And and so the sense of the, of Mr. Ruskin, the great Ruskin coming to talk to us, mm -hmm. um, is really uh, an important part of thinking about how this lecture was received. I was taken by your your image at the beginning of the of the building itself and all the seemingly hundreds of people milling around outside mm -hmm. i thought it reminded me of the people who had come out to hear him on this winter night in any event he's enormously popular and this becomes deeply ironic given what he's going to do in the second half of the lecture because he's mm -hmm. going to attack them as being complicit in the destruction of the age and the world itself in mm -hmm. any event i think it's very important for us to keep in our heads the sense of Ruskin at the height of his popularity. He's mm. about to begin to destroy that popularity mm. because in those days, at least as I know them, and I, I don't know them anywhere near as well as you do, in, in those days, I don't think people went 
well-heeled people with their fineries and their carriages waiting outside. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't think they went to hear lectures berate them for no. being essentially the evil folk of, of the of the era itself. Mm -hmm. So there's a deep irony of building here and he knows exactly what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So the, the popularity of Ruskin at the time, the audience's expectations, very important to keep in mind here. Yeah. Really, really good points. Really good points. Yeah. Yeah. As you say, that sort of transpires in the second half of the lecture. Yep. Well, I was thinking too, reading this, he uses that phrase, the circles of vitality. Um, and what you said about Melville, I hadn't thought about Melville in connection with this at all, but now I'm going to be thinking about it more um, in that chapter where he talks about the different attributes and parts of the whale. And there's this sense yeah. of this or organic sort of connection between all things and everything. Yeah. And there's so much of that in this lecture. And one of the things I love about it is that idea of, you know, the air and the iron and the iron having a kind of soul in it. Um, yeah. And it makes me think of where he says elsewhere, he talks about the veil of intermediate being, the earth veil that exists between yeah. man and the world. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, um, you know, it's not just, it's it's the element, you know, the, the iron and it's the air, but it's also in our blood. Like you had you'd kind of focused on that as well. Um, mm -hmm. the, tie, the sense of us all being tied together, that's so important in all of Ruskin and runs through all his work. Yeah. I just think it's so strong, but it's also the way that it's expressed in this lecture. Yeah. And I like the way you were talking about the connection with Blake and this this kind of um, almost fantastic or supernatural sort of approach to it. Um, yeah. it's, it's poetic, but it's also it's it's very power, powerfully visionary. Yeah. Very much so, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, along almost, with that, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. yeah a, along with that, I, I uh, just to underline it. You know, we 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 often talk about Ruskin as a proto ecologist. In terms of the storm of the 19th century and his yeah. uh, climatological observations yeah. and all of that, but it's much much deeper than that. Ruskin is an ecological thinker at the core. Mm. I mean, he thinks ecologically. Yeah, he's always thinking of how things form systems mm. and how they're how they're connected from bottom to top and from top mm. to bottom. So that he so that it, this is a, a kind of a the ecological meaning of iron mm -hmm. yes. as he traces you know yes. the yes yes yeah you froze yeah. I, um, I wanted to thank you for for two things um in particular I, I i appreciate the context you give at the beginning of this um when i've read ruskin's lectures you know they often just sort of pop out of a book um but it's nice to sort of see sort of the context in which this was delivered, not only at a very fancy hotel, but what was happening around it. So just to see this as a popular, you know, form of entertainment or learning um, that he was just sort of just part of, you know, and leaning into, as you mentioned, um, as the closest connection between his thoughts and his audience. Um, and I also appreciated your just ob observing his, his use of surreal and fantastical imagery. I, th I mean, like you, you encounter these things every now and then, but it was nice of you to highlight that with the iron wire example, because um, he, he uses those things to great effect and often, I think, grisly effect at times. And um, and I know you went here with the, um, the bit about oxygen and iron, and Ruskin brings this up twice, really explicitly. And this, for me, is really the, the most important part of this of this piece of the lecture. Um, that iron is nothing without the air, oxygen, or the breath of life. And that is really what I think is the thread that carries through to the end. Because um, it's all about how are you giving life to the world um, through your social action, through art. Art means nothing unless you've put in the labor, you've put in the work to bring something out of the material or the instrument. And um, and I think this is this is one of the big, I think, leaps into his political economy too, because he's always a Gabriel often mentioned, Ruskin is always giving you a choice about your action. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think this is a nice sort of, again, connecting to the natural environment, mm -hmm. oxygen, breath of life into this inner material. Mm -hmm. Well, as we extend into the social world, we do the same thing, mm -hmm. right? We have a choice about how we breathe life into mm -hmm. the world around us. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's, those are really interesting observations. It's interesting is because because Darwin's Origin of Species is published the next year. Mm. Yeah, so many things. You know, and also Ruskin's 
love for Rose Latouche begins with that meeting this year. And he also meets Georgina Cooper, um, Cooper Temple, uh, who takes him into another world, you know, the world of the of spiritualism. Um, that they, 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 they Rusk, it was close, it's only about 10 miles from here that um, Ruskin was conducting those seances with Georgina Cooper um, uh, later on in life, trying to contact Rose. Um, uh, and all that kind of, what Ruskin was hoping for, what what seemed possible at that period in time, you know, the possible things seemed possible, but also there's the, you know, it's the counterpoint is the is the fact of Ruskin's own loss of sanity, which seems so linked to when you know when you when you when you go to Brentwood and you can you actually can you put up that the next slide yeah. actually so mm -hmm. Brentwood Brentwood okay. I mean. Um, just the uh, so the yeah so Brent with the lake and um, you want the lake or the the window shot yeah and then look and look at the window as well um, the way that the the natural world is contained and framed by Brentwood mm. I, I was really thinking about that during the work of Iron um, the, the imposition of structure as you know, that point at which you know the Brantwood, the terrible Brantwood diary, where he actually does sort of lose his mind, as it were, and um, and during that he 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 talks about Blake, my my Blake, um, you were mad too, um, the fact that art, you know, art could save him, um. And you know he he's entering a period of his life now, isn't he? In the eighteen fifties, as as she says, is he he he's he's a a worldwide known artist. But I think things become cut adrift. So that's I don't know why I feel that in in the work of Iron that that's sort of maybe I don't know where that's starting. I don't know. Um, he, he he for all, all, all of the all of his achievements and all of his what he makes and what he realizes um it's like uh, I come it's Norton is it who says there is always this deep current that you can't you can't access with Ruskin mm. um yeah really interesting uh, and I do think about Turner as well, because Turner's sense of transforming, you know, transforming pigment into image, um, but creating something which is so strange uh, and so elemental itself. You know, I, I often think that, you know, when Ruskin's at his best, as he is in this lecture, that he's using his words in the same way. It's, it's very impressionistic, this lecture it's very it's so loose in many ways but I mean, loosed from the restrictions of what anyone else was really talking about at that point i think really i don't know well i was thinking of turner too it's interesting you bring him up when you were speaking because i, I kept thinking of his painting rain steam and speed i was yeah. thinking exactly that this week yeah that's exactly <laughs> what i was thinking yeah, I mean, it's got, it's got, it's all it's so elemental. It's got all the elements, but yet it's got yeah. this iron, you know, lo locomotive coming at you right out of the, the exactly. frame of that picture. And I hadn't really thought about it in connection with this lecture before. And then as you were talking, I thought, you know, Turner's doing kind of a similar thing. You know, it's, we've got the, you know, the man-made and the artificial right there immersed in, in the natural. Yeah. So funny. I absolutely <laughs> was looking at that picture just yesterday for that reason. Oh, wow. Yeah. And of and, course, uh, M and, Melville is a big Turner. Is Turner is is very important to Melville too. So okay. Anyway. In, in that picture, we shouldn't forget in the very bottom of the picture on the uh, right hand side, the uh, locomotive chasing down the terrified bunny. Yes, Nature the bunny. hair. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's right. That's right. Yes. Iron horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I'm afraid I did think about Jura's hair there as well. <laughs> Because it's a tiny little hair, isn't it? It's just there, and it's yeah. yeah. So, 
Um, just, yeah. Well, you, you were talking too about Ruskin as someone who's thinking, he's working in the future. Mm. And and you say that in Albert and the Whale about Durer too, I think, right? Mm. I mean, these are people, that's Ruskin, and, and you say that about Ruskin in that book, I believe also, they're, they're people who are already working in the future and thinking in the future. Mm. And I was thinking about in the, one of the letters of Forrest Covidura, where Ruskin says, you know, I'm, I'm not writing these letters for the the men of the 1870s. I'm writing them for those who will come in the future and will understand them. And he says, people ask me, why are you writing this? You know, nobody's going to listen to this. Well, I'm not writing it for the people of, of today. Um, and I, he already had this awareness that I'm saying something that will have meaning to someone, even if not now. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. But I just like that idea of some of that that phrase that you use about writing in the future. I really or working in the future rather. I like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Well, again, let let me let me pick up a theme that your lecture made me think about a number of times. The lectures delivered in early 1858. Ruskin is now working on the last volume of Modern Painters, as well as thinking very hard about the essays that will become unto this last. Mm -hmm. So he's there and those things are in his mind, but not in this particular lecture. Mm -hmm. One of the things that struck me about the lecture and your presentation of the natural part of it was this notion of the function of iron in the world. We've mm -hmm. talked about this in a couple of ways. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the fifth volume of Modern Painters, when it finally came out, there's a wonderful passage. And I mentioned this to Gabriel as something we might think about later on for a study session. There's this wonderful passage about the office of the mountains. What he means by the office of the mountains is that the mountains have work to do in the world. And the mountains do wonderful things for the world. And there's about four or five pages of the office of the mountains in Modern Painters 5, where he talks about how the mountains not only are wonderful and beautiful things, but they purify the air. They water the earth. They make life possible on the earth. They have a function and left alone, they will... They will perform this function nicely for us. In the same way in this lecture, iron has a function. And if we know what it is and we know how to watch it and use it properly, we will prosper. If we do not know how to watch it and use it properly, we will suffer. Hence, mm -hmm. the paint, hence Turner's painting that we were talking a moment ago. So iron has an office. The mountains have an office. Everything really fundamentally mm -hmm. in the way Sarah was just talking about it has an office, has a job. Yeah. to do in the world some some bet way to be bene beneficent for human beings mm -hmm. that's a central part of what i think he's trying to communicate in the first part of the lecture do you think he's optimistic about that though do you think what no. do you think no i think by that point he's becoming very pessimistic yeah yeah that's what i think yeah yeah definitely when yeah. you had just mentioned philip you know ruskin's mental illness and the troubles that he goes on you know not too far into the future to suffer and you were kind of thinking i i, I think you were saying that maybe you can see some some of that beginning some of that you know unease in, mm. in this lecture and I, I was also thinking about you know, he paints this dystopian vision of what the earth would look like with all yeah. the paper drained from it or with the iron spikes growing up those are yeah. fantastic mm. images and right. then you cited one of my favorite and i think one is one is one of the most intriguing lines from Ruskin about um, the sunflower and the man with the sunflower in his head. Yeah, yeah. And he says, I don't believe any of you would like to live in a room with a murdered man in the cupboard, however yes. well-preserved chemically, even with a sunflower growing out of the top of his Unbelievable. head. And Unbelievable. That to me is one of the most fabulous yeah. lines in Ruskin. Yeah, right? yeah, totally, totally, <laughs> yeah. totally. So it's, it's as, if it's, as if those dystopian visions that, that he's you know describing here, we they get darker and more surreal until yeah. we get to that, right? Yeah, totally, totally, yeah. yeah. There's so much that you see in the way that art turns in the 20th century, you know, through the surrealists, through modernism, through, you know, I'm th I think of Man Ray's rayograms. Hmm. It's kind of the, the kind of notion that Ruskin is drifting into kind of an ectoplasmic world in which you know which he imagines he will achieve union with rose Latouche, um that that there's a utopian sense to that as well uh because of the way what's happening to christianity is a faith 
uh, that it's it's splintering, you know, the whole sort of withdrawing sea of faith, uh, Matthew mm-hmm. Arnold, and that 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 it's a big long retreat for Ruskin, really, um, and the whole the whole tragedy about Rose and 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 also you know his relationship with art that 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 it turns back on it's back on him, you know, the whole thing about Whistler. Mm-hmm. Um, the way that he, the way that he, ser- he, you know, he's searching Turner's house and is shocked by what he finds. He doesn't want to talk about it. Only really starts to talk about it supposedly when he starts to lose his sanity. Supposedly, um, that he's really seems aware of cumulative powers that he can't control. Um, but sometimes it seems as though he's at the center of that. Mm. I think that he he kind of realized, you know, if he is responsible for propagating ideas, new ideas in the time of Darwin uh, about nature and about the relationship to what humans are doing to the world and what the way the world is is being used. Um, you know, I don't know what that, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how he dealt with that, really. Because when you see, when you look at those watercolours of, of the natural world, the earlier world, they are so intensely beautiful. They're almost madly beautiful. Um, it's as though he can't deal with, deal with the knowledge of what he has, um, the way he sees things. Well, he talks to, uh, you know, as he later, later into the 1860s and 1870s about nature having become dark for him in some ways. It's mm. not mm. it's not all beneficent, you know, as no. he used to see it. Mm. And and that's that's a, a grief for him in some ways, too, yeah. even though it does give him this deeper vision. And mm. I know John Muir said one of the reasons he didn't like the later volumes of modern painters was because Ruskin's vision was too dark. And Muir was intent on this, mm. you know, much more beneficent you know, mm. cheerful vision of nature. And he didn't like that about Ruskin, but Ruskin thought, well, no, you know, there's there's the darkness in nature as well as the light, and we have to look at both of them. But mm. that awareness troubles him deeply. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't know whether Ruskin is being treated well by history. <laughs> I think so, yeah I mean, we keep trying to get him treated better doing all these things right <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> introducing more people to him and having more people learn about him yeah I, I he still has so much to say I mean when I teach him to students you know at first they have to get used to the language but mm-hmm. but then they're just shocked by how these ideas are still so relevant to what we're talking about today um they just can't believe that somebody who they think was this you know buttoned up stiff guy in sepia <laughs> in the photographs is talking about these really you know exciting and important things and using this kind of language to to do it exactly i agree with that sarah when yeah. i was teaching, which i haven't been doing full time for a long long time now but when i was teaching i found that my students almost all of them at some level resonated with ruskin mm-hmm. in the way that you just described they yeah. find they thought to themselves, well, this is really important stuff. This is what we came to university to learn about, the deep issues of life. And mm-hmm. they, not many of them went on to become Ruskin people, but that's not the point. The point is right. the, the, what he calls in some of the ideas that can never die. Um, mm-hmm. Those ideas are embedded in his work. And, uh, and real many folks just resonate with this. They say, oh, that's really important. Why haven't I thought more seriously about that before? One yeah. of the Ruskin greatest talents is the ability to put into his lectures and into his conversations with people, even into his many thousands upon thousands of letters that he wrote, this sense of the vitality of life and the the central function performed by human beings in the world itself. And people resonate, they do resonate with that. They want to know those things. They want to hear those things. They want to think about those things. Yeah, I think you're right. I think they also like that he challenges the reader or the listener in the case of a lecture like this. I agree. You know, he says you're you're complicit 
mm. and doesn't leave you any room to squirm out of it, you know, um, the confrontational aspect of it. Mm. 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 If I, I may. Thinking, what? If, if, if I may, uh, in, several, in several regards, uh, I'd like to thank uh, or agree with, with, with Zachary uh, and thank you thank you all for giving the these new perspectives in looking at at, at ruskin's work i'd like to also um oh bring up a point that gabriel had, had brought up further that ruskin was looking at uh, at things in uh, as systems and not not in a specialized way one of the unfortunate tendencies of our modern education is to specialize on particular points of view, mm -hmm. rather than seeing things as a whole. I think the genius of Ruskin and the example given by our lecturer today is the ability to look at things from a number of different perspectives. Ruskin in particular, as regards the difference between um, looking at iron from the standpoint of nature, of art and of art history and of of the whole process by which human beings use uh, uh, nature, and then finally, in, uh, as regards policy, um, or social or economic uh, or, or or political theory, and he weaves all of these together in a way that mere specialists cannot. Again, I'd like to thank the the, the lecturer here uh, to to this morning for this, uh, th this lovely use of Ruskin's method. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the perspectives that he brings in the next lecture. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. much. It's interesting you brought up system, Ruskin thinking in systems. You're, you're referencing something Gabriel had said, because I've been hearing, not, not a lot, but I've been, I've been coming across more and more this idea of systems theory as something that is kind of taught at the university level, this interdisciplinary way of, of thinking, but also looking at the way that various, you know, systems relate to one another in a larger, you know, more, more complex system. And when I've heard it spoken about, um, I never hear Ruskin reference, but every time I hear it, I think, God, Ruskin was doing, was doing that, you know, 150, almost 200, you know, 200 years ago um, in his writing. It was just his natural way of looking at the world. And he didn't give it a label or anything, um, but but that's what he was doing, you know, seeing the way that all these different things connect. Um, yeah, so it's, I, I kind of want to tell all the, the people who are teaching this, this systems theory, wait a minute, there's an important person you, you need to include yeah. in your syllabi. Well, perhaps someone should uh, endeavor to show that systems thinking in Ruskin. That mm. would be an interesting point of, of view for, for a lecture in the future. You know, it would actually, to look at Ruskin through that lens and, and kind of describe him as a systems thinker. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And yes. the perspectives that, that he, he brings and mm. the ability to shift perspective. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, well. I was interested, Philip. The, someone else already commented. On, I think Zachary commented on this, but the way that you framed this um, mm -hmm. by talking about the other lectures that were happening at the time, yeah. number twelve. Because uh, I didn't. I realized I don't didn't really know about that. I didn't know what else was was being spoken about in those lectures. And if you think about the fact that probably a lot of the same people went to the lectures, if they were a series or if people were in the habit of attending. Um, you know, what was the context in which this was happening? That's really interesting to me. Yeah. Well, I think because you have the sort you have the tradition of the, the mechanics institutes, which are kind mm. of those kind of lectures. That, but so for the kind of the, the genteel, <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's a time when you know theatre, some theatre wasn't isn't actually respectable to go to for mm -hmm. some people. Um, so it's an entertainment um like a magic lantern slide mm -hmm. show or, or something like that so there's there's that sense of or, and and also um uh i think the notion of this small town it's a very small town having um 
supporting something like that or being you have this grand person arrives and so it becomes like um uh an expression of their their they're looking at the modern world that that they right. they that they're, they're, they're um we're being modern by bringing these people to our little town right it's quite adventurous to, i mean it's quite adventurous for them to for ruskin to be lecturing in in tunbridge wells you know um and so there's a there's a certain so i i suspect there was a i suspect many of the people didn't have any idea what he's talking about right <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, you know, um, but they're aware, as with like Wild Tour of America, mm -hmm. it's enough that it's this great man is in our little town. Right. You know, mm -hmm. Being charismatic, being mm -hmm. extraordinary. I mean, we will never know what Ruskin looked like when he when he lectured, but one gets the impression there's a lot of gesticulation, there's a lot of movement. Mm -hmm. Um, he must have been an incredibly charismatic person, you know. Yeah. And he has, because he, he has a, 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 a Scottish accent. He would have a faint Scottish accent. We don't know how much, but it would be. So there's a there's a command to his uh, a, a voice, but also a, a lilt as well. That's how I hear him. You know, I don't. We have don't know, but um, so he was. He must have been. He he. he I think to me, he always seems someone who's very aware of the job he has to do to mm. present his complicated yeah. I ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And I think of kind of almost the stagecraft of his lectures, too, that we Absolutely. hear described. I mean, there's that lecture where he has uh, the Turner painting, which is, you know, covered in glass in a frame. Um, and he draws on it, you know, s smoke and stuff like that. When he's talking about what indus industry is doing yeah. to the environment and is this what you want your landscape to look like or and then he takes a cloth and wipes it all off, you know, and it's just I mean, that sort of yeah. charismatic, like, as you were saying, really charismatic presentation. Yeah. Um, do you think in Tunbridge Wells that I mean, here they were bringing in these lecturers, do you think there was a sense of I don't want to say smugness, but a sense that here we are very progressive and we are bringing yes. in these people and so for him to come in and give this lecture, there's a bit of a puncturing of that. Like here you are, you're all, you're a bit proud of yourselves for hosting us all, but now I'm going to tell you, you think that's part of it? Absolutely. And I think because his lecture in Bradford later on that year is the same thing. Same thing He's yeah. addressing the burgers of Bradford and saying, look, <laughs> you may think you are the bee's knees, but you really, you really are not. <laughs> no. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, that's so good. I mean, he's a great disruptor, Ruskin. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that's never people don't think it's like you say your students think of being sort of beardy, sepia, sort of Victorian right. worthy. So he must have been, must have been like, in my, I was when I started being this, I think, God, that must have been like seeing the first night of the Rite of Spring <laughs> or the Sex Pistols playing in Texas in 1977. Right. I mean, it's just like, oh, wow. Yeah, that probably was nothing like the other lectures they were attending. No, no nothing like. <laughs> it could not, yeah. never be like. Yeah. Um, I would like to slip in another comment going back to something Bernard was saying about the systems aspect of Ruskin. And I'm kind of a Gandhi geek. And for me, Gandhi took what Ruskin was doing and applied it not only to his own internal ethical life, but into how do we how do we take India and make her independent of England? Mm. It was a practical application of systems thinking, mm. all resting or mm. resting on Ruskin's work. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. That's very, point. Mm -hmm. very interesting. Yeah. Well, I think sometimes we also we also forget the connection between the um, the star lecture and the sermon. Mm -hmm. That you know, many of the same people that would have yeah. come to the lecture in Tunbridge Wells would would have been uh, in a church service on Sunday morning, yeah. where the the standard for sermons would have been very high. Absolutely, you, you, you know, a real chance. a real uh, rhetorical performance. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I think, yeah. you know, we uh, exactly we think about that. And also, you know, Ruskin himself, of course, was a connoisseur of sermons. Attending, oh, 
church yeah, and yeah. listening to star ser sermonizers and homilists uh, throughout the rest of his life. L uh, like Charles Spurgeon, who, who, who right, exactly just, just down the road from there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it was a real age of the sensational sermon, wasn't it? There was a lot yes. of, uh, 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 of that happening. Um, yeah, I like that. You think I of Gerard, Gerard and Manny Hopkins delivering sermons you know, during that period. <laughs> That's he's, extraordinary. I'd yes, love to have he's, Hopkins. He's very yeah. complex, interwoven, uh, you know, uh, rhetorical yeah. performances. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think people people's experience of Hopkins's lectures at uh, uh, sermons were completely not. They were completely nonplussed. I think. Really. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Just, <I don't> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the analogies he drew alone. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're wild, wild, wild. He he's he's very interesting. He he, uh, he he had quite a lot of opinions about Ruskin. He wasn't hugely respectful of Ruskin, Hopkins. I don't think, but. Uh, but he's an obviously an obvious influence on Rus mm. uh, Ruskin. Is an obvious influence on Hopkins. Oh yes, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And as Ruskin grows older, his relationship to the established church grows more and more distant and more and more angry. I mean, mm. he essentially stops going to church in the eighteen seventies, never really goes back, That's and he, he he then has many many uh, long letters and essays where he attacks this. Uh, established church. He's a good sociologist. He is ta attacks the the, um, the established church as being in the pockets of the rich and the powerful. Mm -hmm. He says, mm -hmm. what you really want to do is you want to get parishioners who will give you a bunch of money to run run the system, but your your uh, your responsibility to communicate the spiritual message of life mm -hmm. falls by the wayside. He yeah. in the end, I find him as no friend of established religion of any kind at all. Very interesting. Right. And in Sesame and Lilies, where he talks about really the theater of the church, mm -hmm. right? Um, he uses that that uh, metaphor for the you know the church as theater rather than as anything to do with true belief. Um, the way that the way that people um, approach it, rather, you know, that this is mm -hmm. a false, you know, kind of self gratifying approach to religion rather than than anything true. You were talking about sermons, and I was thinking of Ruskin in um, Preterita when he says he gives his first sermon at age four and stands <laughs> on the cushions and says, people, be good. Be good. <laughs> yeah. Which is really his message for the rest of his life. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, That's fantastic. I think he's one of the most attractive figures in, in literature I can think of. He's the one person I'd really, one of the people who I'd really love to have yeah spoken with or heard to talk it's because that, that so many people because of the lectures he gave so many people would have had that personal impression of him wouldn't they and, and you wonder how that ex fed his reputation or you know or his the appreciation of what he was doing i mean that must have really opened up people to what to go and read ruskin basically you know the, the mm -hmm. um but rather like Dickens, you know, but Dickens is a much more sort of commercial prospect. But, but with, you know, I didn't realize that he would actually give people, let give like talks to people who came into his house in Denmark Hill. Mm. Just like off the cuff sort of things, is almost. Um, you know, it's an interesting contrast. We think of what he, what he would have been like at a dinner party, yeah. <laughs> what, what, what it would have been like to have Ruskin present. Yeah. And we actually have with uh, Stillman, his uh, associate for uh, some years, uh, a description, which is you know, sort of very, very um, contrary to what we might imagine. Stillman even says that people expected that, you know, the prophet Jeremiah was coming to dinner <laughs> and that Ruskin would be this Old Testament prophet denouncing your, uh. you know, your silver. Uh, <laughs> And he says he was the gentlest of men. Yeah, he was very gentle, enormously kind, and terribly interested in what people thought. Like he would be the kind of person who would draw you out and ask you, you know, very deep questions about what your views were, without necessarily giving his own. Which mm -hmm. is, a, I think, sort of counterintuitive to what we think about from the Ruskin on the page. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. 
and what a lovely evocation of him as well yes I, it was such a generous that's a lovely portrait of him yeah. yes there are dozens if not hundreds of tributes to ruskin where they talk about his gentleness and conversation how he did really want to hear what you had to say and listen very, very carefully to what you had to say, not always expressing the fact that he would disagree with 98% of what you had to say. <laughs> but he did, in fact, uh, uh, try to pull people's deeper thoughts out of them and try to process them. Well, and you read about him having to give his lectures twice sometimes because the hall would be too full um so that he would have to or they have to move to a bigger hall and at oxford this sometimes happened and um yeah it's so just to get, it gives you a sense of the appeal that he had you know as yeah. a speaker um mm -hmm. to the public yeah I, I think you know he touched a lot of people mm. um mm. it's it's and that influence does carry on it's almost Almost the kind of memory of that carries on into the 20th century. Yeah. It's the memory of Ruskin. Mm -hmm. he, he dies in the 20th century. He makes it, well, just mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Makes it to the right. 20th century. Yeah. Philip, I want to ask you a question. Do you yeah. have any idea of how many people heard him that night in Tunbridge Wells? I don't. It doesn't. We don't know. I don't know what the capacity of the It's not going to be huge. Um mm -hmm. So I don't have a we don't have a note. I could try and find out, but um. Well, that would be interesting to find out. Yeah, I would. Know... Let me try and find out before the next thing. I, uh, yeah, because it's uh, yeah. I, but um... lecture in Dublin, um, in oh, it would be ten years after this, mm. uh, and and there were a thousand people in the hall. That's yeah, oh. that's substantial. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which also just says something about the culture of the time. That's very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the interest that people had for 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 learning in this sort of yeah. you know, more popular or accessible way. I mean, there was and so many people were elected a lot of public figures lecturing at the time. And obviously some people like Ruskin were, you know, had a, a greater draw. Um, mm -hmm. but just the interest in this kind in, in the public lecture and in, in this mm -hmm. kind of learning is is pretty mm -hmm. fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the respect. And the, and the respect for an interest in science as well as right, mm -hmm. yeah, because uh, it's still relatively new. Quotes science, isn't it, mm. as as a thing? Yeah. Um, witness the other lectures that they're having. Though. I mean, that's amazing. That other lecture they have about solar magnetism and things uh, uh, at the Sussex Hotel. Right. Uh, for the time, you know, it, it, it seems you know. I mean. It's, And so next week we'll move on to the next yeah. of this lecture. Yeah. <laughs> and I was wondering too, because you had that we have that great photograph of the Oxford Museum, which is is a wonderful building. I've I've been there and it's it's yeah. fantastic. But I'm wondering if we're going to come back to that because as you were showing it, I was thinking, you know, yeah, the, the iron grows out of the stone columns there, but there's those fine uh, leaves made of iron you know and what yeah. he's, he talks about of course in the next half of this is what you should be using iron for and i, I looked at that and i thought hmm so yeah. <laughs> i wonder if we're going to return to that yeah. I, I was trying to get a photo i don't uh, that's the photo i took those photographs but i couldn't get close into the leaves they could look yeah. quite high up but yeah mm -hmm. yeah those are those are great so that that's a that's a very interesting example yeah uh, for us to be thinking about when we come to that part of the lecture where he's talking about you know the the, the uses of it in art and mm. working with the material um mm. and for what it's intended for so yeah very interesting good thank you for that tip <laughs> oh I, I was just it just made me think of it i thought wow yeah, I, really. I hadn't even thought of to put those together so yeah, yeah. Well, thank you philip so very much no thank Indeed. you very much for getting up early and listening to me and but uh, so much nicer for me to listen to you to be honest it's lovely to hear you all talk thank you for staying up late to talk to us yes, <laughs> yes. 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 i should have said at the beginning that philip is speaking to us from southampton so it's his yeah. evening yeah. our morning <laughs> right. and um so we'll have the day you know we're starting our day with a lot to think about and you're ending yours with with, with this yeah. Well nice. so yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for, for doing this and for being uh, here and pleasure. Um, we're really looking forward to, to next week's discussion. Next too. week, same time, same yeah. station. Same station. Right. Same.
same bat channel as they say. And um, <laughs> yeah, it's great to be able to discuss this essay with other people who are interested in it. So I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Me too. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you much. Philip. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Take care and have yep. a good evening, bye -bye. Philip. It's great to see you. And you, lovely to bye. see you, sir. Bye. Bye-bye. And Gabriel, hello, bye.